Welcome to the Troubadour Podcast. Today I'll be reading The Last of the Flock by William Wordsworth in his 1798 Lyrical Ballads. Now, this is a ballad. And if you remember, a ballad is a story told in a poetic way. So it is a story, there's a person, and he is explaining something that occurred to him. And it's important in what is going on. If you've listened to any of the ballads that I've done in the past, I did a short uh, stint and I'll do a couple more ballads in the future, but it is a short stint on the podcast with uh, called Ballad Wednesdays, where I read traditional ballads. And a traditional ballad is very straightforward. It's something that a group of people in um, Ireland or England, and really in, in anywhere in the world, but you know we're focusing on this region of the world at the moment, and it's something that they would come together, they'd tell a story, and it would be in a kind of meter, like a song-like manner. And the ballads, as they've evolved into the 19th, 18th century, I should say, in, in 1798, and before this as well, and, and after this, is what is kind of happening is they are taking that very simple form, the, the story form that's been told, and they're really putting it in through the the masterful poetic verse and um you know beautiful use of language allusion meter and all the things you can do with poetry which we'll talk about and in wordsworth in particular the focus and this is critical so if you've been listening you've heard me use this term a million times and you'll hear a lot more imagination 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 that is critical. And in one way to think about imagination, and there's a lot of ways, you know, about how we look out at the world, at the stuff of the world, at the trees and the people and a person walking down the street and he's, he looks sad or he looks jubilant or, you know, there, there's some loss that just occurred. There's a lot of events that you see in the world and you hear and you listen to and you you can taste things and you can feel things and smell things and how you integrate that into something new is important. But the question is, how do you make that leap? How do you make that leap of seeing things in the world and putting them together in something new? And in Wordsworth's view, that was through imagination and in particular poetic imagination could teach you. So his whole perspective was that by reading these types of stories put in the meter and in the language of everyday men. So this is the, the language that he's using, the way he's using poetry is there's a striking difference. There's not what is called poetic vocabulary, vocabulary and terms that you don't see anywhere outside of voc outside of poetry. So when you read, you know, if you uh, follow along with metaphysical Mondays that I do and the Cavalier poets and, and really most many poets, uh, poets, the classic poets before Wordsworth, and even a lot of them afterward, even Keats did this to some degree, they use a terminology that is exclusive to uh, poetry. And in fact, if you go to the dictionary, you'll see certain terms that will have like a special, it'll have a definition of a normal, the normal everyday definition, and then it'll have like a special, uh, you know, literary definition. There's some words that are only in literature, only in poetry in particular, that you can use. So you can find a, a list of these online, by the way, but just as an example of a couple like ichor, I-C-H-O-R, blood or fluid likened to it. This is one of the um, you know, things that you can use for literary terms and that only that are really only used in literary terms. You wouldn't find them elsewhere. People don't walk around talking about ichor, right? They they don't talk about something like that or um, you know. What's another one here that's a good one, I think? Let me see. Flaxen. I mean, you see that a lot in classic poetry. Flaxen, which means pale yellow. That's not something most people on the street, even back hundreds, a couple hundred years ago, that's not common. Evanescent, quickly fading. I mean, that's something you might write in sometimes today, but it's more literary. It's more poetic. And the, So the point is that there are these terms that are somewhat unfamiliar to most of us, but they are common to um, poetry. So you had to, there was this kind of class that you had to read poetry and you had to, you had to really, un, in order to understand this 
terminology, just like if you want to understand science. So if you want to become a, or a lawyer, like if you want to become a lawyer, you, ha you have to go to college because, and you have to go to a university because you have to learn the terminology, the cases, you have to learn, learn the language. Same thing with science. Like, you know, as a layman, I can learn a good amount about science, but it's very hard to, to really master it with, master all the terminologies in physics without studying physics. Now, this was also true about literature. And to some degree, it's still true, but here's the, here's the thing that I think Wordsworth is really trying to get at. And, and I think this is true of science and, and law. I think this is important that, you know, I think it's a mistake that we've gone this. I mean, there are reasons why we've gotten this uh, esoteric and, and this uh, specialized in these fields where you have to have this degree. And I understand why you need that to practice it, but there's, I think there is a huge mistake that's been made and Wordsworth is trying to correct it in literature. And that's the mistake of disconnecting it from the possibility of normal people understanding what it's trying to preach or teach or elucidate or show. That is a huge problem that literature, like when you read certain pe works of literature today, even all the way up to like literature, I mean, serious lit. Not, not popular, not pop fiction, not mystery thrillers, which, I, you know, those are all wonderful, but I'm talking about like the deep literature. A lot of times it's impossible to understand to this day. Although lately that, you know, one of the reasons it's impossible to understand is because there's, you know, like uh, just stream of consciousness or some subjective way of doing a narrative where the narrative doesn't make any sense. And that is another issue. <laughs> But even if you, you go into, you know, more recent times in general, it, it can be difficult to read, you know, something like Moby Dick. Now, some of that is the fault of our education, but some of that is what Wordsworth is trying to combat, which is he's trying to make it readable and understandable by the everyday intelligent person, right? Just the, the normal person who can read English should be able to read great poetry without having to be an expert in poetry. And that's one of the things that he was really attacked for. And one of the reasons he thought that is because he believed, like fervently, this is one of his deepest beliefs, that the way to train people morally on right or wrong, how to act, what to do, was through the use of the imagination. So in the last of the flock that we are, that we are going to read today, he wants you to see this life of this, um, this, this man that has, you know, he's a shepherd and what's happened to his life. And in order to see it, you have to have an imagination. You have to be able to empathize. And the way to empathize is to be able to teach you how to be, use your imagination. But the way to use your imagination is you have to be able to access poetry. But if, if poetry is inaccessible to you because you're not educated at Cambridge, you're just a normal person who just learned how to read. That is the fundamental problem. And also poetry is primarily a spoken language. I mean, written is a big part of it, but speaking is the most important part, or I, th I think one of the most important parts of it, the sounds of the words. So he wanted to put it in a meter, you know, and this is why it's often an iambic pentameter, which is the, the, the one, the, the meter that most closely represents speech patterns and that, you know, the way that we use syllables and sentences to this day, it's not exact. And it always does sound, you know, he does change it up a little bit. I'm not saying that it's exactly like listening to me talk on this podcast right now, but it's, it's close or as close as a great poet poetry can get, I think. Okay. So let's read through this and then we'll go stanza by stanza. Now it's not um, long, but it's not super short either. It's not two or three stanzas. I didn't uh, count it exactly, but it's it's a good, you know, couple pages of uh, print. It'll probably take me a couple minutes to read through it slowly for you. One word, uh, you probably know what it is if you saw it, but if you heard it, you may not. It's you. I, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. It's an you. Um, it's a female sheep. So the basic story is that the narrator, and I want to tell you this so you can have the structure, a narrator, uh, or the narrator, Wordsworth presumably, sees a man weeping on the side of the road with a sheep. 
in his hands. He go, you know, he talks to them, the, and and basically he, the man with the sheep tells him the story of how he had these. Um, you know, I don't want to give away the ending, but he had a lot of. You know, he bought an ewe, a female, you know, sheep when he was um, in his youth and single, and then he started growing it. He got married. His children grew and grew and grew. He had ten children, um, which was revised to six in in eighteen hundred for some reason. I guess Wordsworth thought it was better um, to to not make it. You know, like ten seemed a little bit too much. Maybe I don't know. <laughs> you know, I guess that's what I. Uh, it seems like. And then he, um, the, the man with the sheep started all of a sudden having difficulties financially because he had so many kids and such a big family. So he started selling them off. And then once he started selling them off, the financial burdens exacerbated, right? It kept going. It was like a, a, a disastrous circle of doom, a doom circle. And he kept having to sell another one, another one. No one would help him because he was sort of quote unquote rich. And you'll see what happens at the end, but the title probably lets you know what happened. Okay, so let's read through this, and I'm just going to read it without commentary, and then we'll come through and go stanza by stanza. Okay, The Last of the Flock by William Wordsworth. In distant countries I have been, and yet I have not often seen a healthy man, a man full grown, weep in the public roads alone. But such a one, on English ground, and in the broad highway I met. Along the broad highway he came, his cheeks with tears were wet. Sturdy he seemed, though he was sad, and in his arms a lamb he had. He saw me, and he turned aside, as if he wished himself to hide. Then with his coat he made essay to wipe those briny tears away. I followed him, and said, my friend, what ails you? Wherefore weep you so? Shame on me, sir, this lusty lamb. He makes my tears to flow. Today I fetched him from the rock. He is the last of all my flock. When I was a young, a single man, and after youthful follies ran, the little given to care and thought, yet so it was a you I bought. And other sheep from her I raised, as healthy sheep as you might see. And then I married, and was rich, as I could wish to be. Of sheep I numbered a full score, and every year increased my store. Year after year my stock it grew. And from this one, this single ewe, full fifty comely sheep I raised as sweet a flock as ever grazed. Upon the mountain did they feed. They throve, and we at home did thrive. This lusty lamb of all my store is all that is alive. And now I care not if we die, and perish all of poverty. Ten children, sir, had I to feed, hard labor in a time of need. My pride was tamed, and in our grief I of the parish asked relief. They said I was a wealthy man, my sheep upon the mountain fed, and it was fit that thence I took whereof to buy us bread. Do this, how can we give to you? they cried. What to the poor is due? I sold a sheep, as they had said, and bought my little children bread. And they were healthy with their food, for me it never did me good. A woeful time it was for me, to see the end of all my gains. The pretty flock which I had reared, with all my care and pains, to see it melt like snow away, for me it was a woeful day. Another still, and still another, a little lamb, and then its mother, it was a vein that never stopped, like blood drops from my heart that dropped. Till thirty were not left alive, they dwindled, dwindled one by one, and I may say that many a time I wish they all were gone. They dwindled one by one away. For me, it was a woeful day. 
To wicked deeds I was inclined, and wicked fancies crossed my mind. And every man I chanced to see, I thought he knew some ill of me. No peace, no comfort could I find, no ease within doors or without. And crazily and wearily I went my work about. Oft times I thought to run away, for me it was a woeful day. Sir, t'was a precious flock to me, as dear as my own children be. For daily with my growing sore I loved my children more and more. Alas, it was an evil time. God cursed me in my sore distress. I prayed, yet every day I thought I loved my children less. And every week and every day my flock it seemed to melt away. They dwindled, sir, sad sight to see, from ten to five, from five to three, a lamb, a weather, and a ewe, and then at last from three to two. And of my fifty, yesterday I had but only one, and here it lies upon my arm. Alas, and I have none. Today I fetched it from the rock. It is the last of all my flock. Okay, so that is The Last of the Flock by William Wordsworth. Now, I think you might have gotten some hints of things, even though some of the language is you know, not exactly the way that we use it. So one of the things you have to do with poetry is arrange it in a prose manner, meaning a, a more analytic way of describing and reasoned you know, arguments. Like, what does this sentence mean? What is, what is he saying with this sentence? And if you read it, and I try to, when I, when I read the poetry, if you're listening on the podcast rather than watching on YouTube or Facebook, when I read it, I try to emphasize the punctuation as much as possible. But this is, I have to say, one of the benefits of reading it is, uh, versus listening is when you read it, you can see where a thought is supposed to be, and you need to have some basic understanding of grammar. So the first sentence, in distant countries I have been, and yet I have not often seen a healthy man, a man full grown, weep in the public roads alone. So that's the first part of the stanza, but that's actually one sentence. So there's uh, four lines there, and that those four lines are one unit in the, in the sense that they are, are, are a sentence. So what's he saying in that sentence? In sentence, in distant countries I've been. So I've been all over the place, and yet I've never seen a healthy man. Right. So this is the the setup. Is we're not talking about a leper, we're not talking about a miser, we're not talking about a person groveling with his legs blown off from a war. We're talking about a healthy man, a man full grown, weep in the public ro roads alone. I've never seen that. But such a one on English ground and in the broad highway I met. Okay, so this is a unit. But so he's saying, but I found one on English ground. So in you know, England is where he's talking about. On a highway, I met somebody like that. Along the broad highway he came, his cheeks with tears were wet. So now we have this whole unit again. Now I take semicolons as this is one. You could take this everything before a semicolon. So you're supposed to have a complete sentence before and after semicolons, by the way. And generally, poets do that. So, you know, you if you're looking at it, but such a one on English ground and in the broad highway, I met. Right? So subject verb, I met. So he, what does that mean? It means I met one like that on English ground on a broad highway. But we're saying also there's, there's a, instead of a period, he has a semicolon. So the second component, the second part of this is another complete sentence that ends there. We see there's a period if you're looking here. So from uh, that, that then completes the entirety of the thought or the relation between those two thoughts. And you could say, however, along the broad highway he came, his cheeks with tears were wet. Or also they were wet, right? So it's a, it's a combination of those two things. So that's the next complete sentence. So what we have is you know, I've never seen anybody in the history of the world, in my or history of my life, 
who's a healthy man weeping on the side of the road. Well, except this one time I met one on the highway in England. And his tears were wet. Right? So he was weeping. So it's a, you know, he's saying the same thing twice, but in different contexts. He seemed sturdy. Sturdy he seemed, though he was sad. And in his arms, a lamb he had. So that's the setup for the whole ballad. Right? So we haven't talked to the um, uh, shepherd yet, the guy with the lamb. So the, la- the guy with the lamb is going to be talking throughout most of this poem. But it's important that Wordsworth is setting it up with this first paragraph by the narrator saying, I've never seen a healthy dude be crying on the side of the road, man. But this one time I did. And let me tell you about this. So, you know, he's going to be telling about this story of, of him quoting this lamb guy. <laughs> okay, here's the next stanza. He saw me and he turned aside as if he wished himself to hide. So what does that mean? Shame, right? He saw me. So it's like, if you've ever cried in your car, which I've never done, ever. <laughs> if you ever like cried in your car <laughs> and you like look over there and someone there's like, ah, ah, right? Like you don't want anybody to see that you're crying or if you're embarrassed about singing, if you're like singing loudly and then you notice someone's there, you're like, oh man, that's what he's saying here. It's like this, this guy, this healthy, virile man is on the side of the road, bawling his eyeballs out. And then another stranger comes, a stranger comes by and, um, you know, it's like they lock eyes and he's like, oh, I have tears in my eyes. That's not manly. I'm looking away. Then with his coat, he made a say to wipe his, he tried to wipe those briny tears away, salty tears, right? So he look, he like, he's wiping his eyes. Like, I'm not crying. You're crying. Right? It's, it's, not, it's, it's not like that. I'm making fun of it a little bit, but you know, so don't take the, the joke side of what I just said seriously. You know, he's, he's wiping away his tears because he doesn't want this person to see him cry. I followed him and said, so now we're, we're in the story. Like we're, we're, we've been having narrative. Now we're going to get dialogue. Quote, my friend, what ails you? Wherefore? Why? Like, hopefully, you know, from reading a little bit of Shakespeare, wherefore? Why weep you so? Shame on me, sir. This lusty, so now he's the uh, shepherd is talking. Shame on me, sir. This lusty lamb, he makes my tears to flow. So I, you know, I cry because of this lusty lamb. Today I fetched him from the rock. He is the last of all my flock. So they were on like a little hill or mountain. He fetched this one, this lamb, and it's the last lamb of his flock. Now, by the way, I will have to say, Lamb is um, generally an animal of innocence. So there is a thing, you know, he's, he's not saying sheep. I think I said sheep quite a bit. And um, while I don't know too much of the difference between a lamb and a sheep, maybe it's just the British version, but, you know, Jesus was often called the little lamb or the lamb. And, you know, there's, there's a lot of um, illusion or view, and you can even think maybe this is a literary term or view, that lamb means innocence in a certain way, but it doesn't have to be. It's like, this is the thing about Wordsworth in particular. You don't need to know that. Like, if you just thought of it as an animal and this guy, you know, if you, if you switch, you know, if you used it abstractly and said, forget the, the lamb, let's just assume it's stuff that he had. Like he's a business owner. So think of this guy as a business owner, right? He, he has a mom and pop store. And then that, so if you take it like that, it's still the meaning of the poem is going to stay intact for the most part. If you add the concept of innocence, it will add a little bit to it, I think, though. Um, and there's a reason why Wordsworth chose Lamb. But he, again, I don't think that's purely literarily or poetry. This is much more broader term. You know, this is in the broader culture. And we think of like the Lamb of God. Like this is a common type of a term. Okay. When I was a young, a single man. So that's a very interesting, so he has that as an incomplete sentence. When I was a young, a single man. And let me, actually, I want to make sure that in the version I have. Yeah. Okay. So I think that's a typo. So in the version I have, the print version of the 1798, which I think is more accurate, it actually goes, when I was a young, a single man, comma. So I think that period is, is not right. Um, a single man, comma, and after youthful follies ran, the little given to care and thought, yet so it was a you I brought, bought, bought. 
So he's basically saying when I was young, you know, and I had all the, I did all the youthful things. I ran with chicks, women, that is not chickens, not little chickies. Um, although maybe chicks too, who knows? He's, he's in the, you know, I want to move on. And after youthful follies ran, the little given to care and thought, you know, he didn't care about the future. He didn't think about the future. But in that time, he made, he made the decision to purchase a female lamb. Another sheep from her I raised. Okay, so a lamb and sheep. Yeah, I probably should know what a lamb and a sheep is. I, I um, okay, yeah. So the, I'm stupid. They, they are the same, of course. So a lamb is under a year old, and a sheep is over in a year. So it's a maturity thing. And a ewe is a female lamb, you know, and sheep, of course. I, perhaps it changes. I don't know if a ewe changes to another term when it grows older. But, you know, picture a fluffy animal that you uh, can shave and get its fur or you can cut it up and eat it um, if you're into that kind of thing, which I am. Okay, so, uh, um, and so, so it was, yeah, so it was a you I bought and other sheep from her I raised as healthy sheep as you might see. And then I married and was rich as I could wish to be. Now, the question is, is he using that term rich? to mean only financial. So in other words, only the material uh, successes of having all these sheep, right? So from, and other sheep from her, I raised as healthy sheep. So he's, the idea is that he bought a ewe. He was able to get her impregnated um, from another uh, lamb, from a, a sheep, a male sheep. And then of course they raised more sheep. And then he himself, as his riches increased, he got married as I, as I could wish to be, you know, I have to say that in, um, whenever I read biographies or histories of around the, like industrial revolution or prior to the industrial revolution, it is just such a tragic fest in terms of love and how people, you know, had to give up on love. If even people who are from a little bit more to do families, I'm not talking about like the poor peasants, the most, the most poor peasants, which is most people. But I'm even talking about people who might have been, um, you know, had some kind of trade or craft. And just the t amount of times they had to give up on love because they just didn't have the money or because the parents wouldn't allow it because the husband, the father, or the potential suitor, male, didn't have the money to do it. And you just hear this over and over and over again. I was just reading about in uh, Wordsworth's biography, you know, his, he had to reject a, a suitable, a nice suitor for his daughter who they seem to be a great match and they seem to like each other, but they, he had to reject it because the, the man didn't have quite the prospects and Wordsworth didn't have the money to be able to take care of them, right? Which is one option. If you're very wealthy, you could say, okay, I'll let you have this stipend, this annuity, this annual income. And the reason I bring this up is just, I do think there's a context here that it helps to have. That if you understand that you do have to have some money to get married to the woman you want to be. And so, and there's a certain amount of money that you need to have to keep her. So it's very different than today. I know we think that, you know, oh, things are so hard sometimes. And sure they are. But really at the end of the day, it's not that hard to make some kind of money. You know, if you find someone you love and that you both, you know, work hard together to make something, you could do it on your own. Like you have the option. Back in these days, you didn't have that option. It's very difficult. Your your opportunities were extraordinarily limited. You had to go through these little paths in society to make money, or you didn't make money. That was until the Industrial Revolution. Okay, so that's a little aside. So, but I think it's important to understand that he got married as he started making well money. So uh, and was as rich as I could be uh, of sheep. I numbered a full score and every year increased my store. So he's starting to increase how many sheep he has, right? He's getting 10, 20, 30, and eventually he's going to have 50 year after year. My stock, it grew. And from this one, this single ewe, full 50 comely sheep. I raised a, as sweet a flock as ever grazed. So that's one thought, right? And he's saying that it's based very simple, right? If my, I'm growing and growing my numbers. It's the most beautiful flock as ever grazed. Like what chop, chomped on the grass for food. Upon the mountain did they feed. 
they throw is like past tense for thrive and uh and we at home did thrive so they they throve they throve and we thrive right so the, there's a combination so as so there's a, he's words were the the lamb uh shepherd is setting up this dual world where as the sheep increased in their stores and pleasures and growth so did his home life the lusty lamb and he's using these terms so like these power these you know little lambs but they are lusty and they're healthy they're not like ragged they're producing something for him this lusty lamb of all my store is all that is alive so oh this is uh, an aside where he's saying in, in the lusty lamb of all my store that there's only one left alive which is the one he is presently holding and now i care not if we die and perish all of poverty. So he's lost all hope in life, all everything, right? He's lost all of his desires. Ten children, sir, had I to feed. Hard labor in a time of need. Right? It's difficult, he's saying, to raise ten children, which I can imagine. My pride was tamed, and in our grief, I of the parish asked relief. So, you know, basically his wife probably, but you know, the whole family and, and he tamed his pride. He said, I'm going to, I want to be a self-sufficient independent person. That's why I bought this. You, I raised it to 50. I built this business. I have this storefront, but I'm, I'm hitting hard times. So I'm going to ask for relief. Now here's where I think things go bad for him, badly for him. They said I was a wealthy man. My sheep upon the mountain fed. And it was fit that thence I took whereof to buy us bread. So what they're saying, you know, hey, you have those 50 sheep, my, my sheep upon the mountain fed. Look at those. Look, see those? Those 50 sheep feeding on our mountain. Well, it's fit that then you should, you know, take one of them and sell them and you can buy you bread. Why would you ask us? And here's what the church continues to say. Quote, do that. Do this. How can we give to you? They cried what to the poor is due. So in other words, because the church went after the, the poor only, they didn't care about anybody who was actually productive, who had a hard time of things. I think in a rational society, this guy is the most worthy of getting uh, aid from people because he's actually proven that he's going to work hard. He's going to grow his stocks right? He's producing something. He can create wool for people and he can cut, you know, shear that wool supposedly. And, you know, maybe once in a while, if he gets enough and he has enough of a surplus, he can butcher one and sell the meat so we could eat. Right. So, there, but there's, there's something going on with that. But the church, when he has uh, hard times in his life, because he had too many kids, let's say, um, although remember this is pre-contraception, so it's not that much. Uh, so it's, you know, not that out of the question. They're not going to help him. Okay. Now, they don't help him when, they need, when he needs it. When he is self-sufficient, they don't help him. So we're going to learn that he's going to become not self-sufficient, right? So now, at the end, by the way, I think it's ironic that when he only has one sheep, he's lost everything, everything's dead, and that sheep is dying now. Now the church might say, okay, we'll give you some food. We might give you a little bit of alms, they called it, A-L-M-S, like giving you some, some assistance, some fi fiduciary financial money, some food, something, shelter. But now it's too late, right? Like this is, this is a problem with the kind of Christian morality, I think, uh, that, that this is my personal, this, I don't this isn't words worth saying, but I think this is a big problem with the, the Christian philosophy, and this is pointing that out, whether it realizes it or not, that you can't just give it to people when they're completely dead down in the dumps. You, you know, if this guy has proven that he can take one ewe and make it into 50 and you give him a little bit of money to, to you know, um, to hold him over for another year so he can try and grow to 55 or 60 or maybe even more, then help the guy out because then he can, you know, uh, take care of his family more easily on his own. I sold a sheep as they had said and bought my little children bread and they were well healthy with their food. All right, so his family's healthy now because he, he did that. Not because he got help, because he sold off some of his products. Product that he needed, by the way. So he wasn't at a point in his life 
when he could have, you know, when he was being able to, to cover his costs, so to speak. Although he was getting there, right? He just needed some more time. And they were healthy with their food. For me, it never did me good, right? So this is a bad thing. So my family is eating, but it's not good for me. A woeful time it was for me to see the end of all my gains, the pretty flock which I had reared with all my cares and pain, care and pains, to see it melt, to see it melt like snow away. For me, it was a woeful day. So selling that first sheep was a woeful, a sad day for him because he could start seeing all the things he was building for fading away. Now, I think one of the things Wordsworth is trying to point out here uh, that I don't necessarily agree with, but is there, there's the Christian idea of it's harder to go through the, the uh, get into heaven. It's harder for a rich man to get into heaven than a camel to pass through uh, the eye of a needle. And that idea that it's more difficult to get into heaven because, you know, because you're making money and that you love money or that you love your, your store or your sheep in this sense. That is a very common Christian view. And there could be a way of reading this, and I, I think this is very likely, that he's being punished now for his love of this these sheep. Right? So that, that's one way of thinking about it. Is you know, it's woeful for him. He's saying um his his family is healthy, but it's sad for him because that which he saw, all the things that he took care of you know, care and pains to build is fading away, but he shouldn't care about that. Right? He, he should be a good Christian and care about giving more of it away to his fellow man. Okay. Now the snow, right now it's going to melt like snow away. He sold one. He wasn't making it. This is important. He wasn't financially making it even at 50 sheep to 10 children and a wife. So once he sold one, whatever income he would have gotten from that is decreased, right? So it's going to cascade. So I sold one, and here we go into the next stanza. Another still, and still another. A little lamb, and then its mother. It was a vein that never stopped, like, drop bl like blood drops from my heart and they dropped. Till thirty were not left alive. They dwindled, dwindled one by one, and I may say that many a time. I wish they all were gone. So he's talking about, like, it's like he slit his vein in a sense. And it's, you know, so that's a very nice, this is one of the great things about good poetry is you get that kind of image, like blood drops from my heart, they drop. So you can imagine the, the sheep drop, drop, drop. Like once one went, it's like poking a hole in a ship, right? It's like you punch a hole in a ship and it's just a little bit, it's just a little bit. But after a while, that little bit keeps building and building and building and it gets bigger and then the ship sinks, right? And that's kind of what happened here. It's like a poked a hole in his heart and each land or each sheet that he has to sell or butcher to, for, for food is another, um, you know, drop out of uh, his heart, right? So it's, it's, think of that metaphor. And then there were only 30 and they dwindled one by one until he had this emotion Right, he felt once he that started to occur. So now we're getting an emotional reaction that um, the, po the the author of this whole thing is trying to get us to understand the relationship between the activity, the action, the event of having to you know butcher his sheep, and the emotion that he felt about it. That at a certain point he just said, I, "I'm done. I just wish they were all gone. I wish I was dead. I wish everything was gone. Right? This is too much for me." They dwindled one by one away. For me, it was a woeful day. This is his emotional reaction, his emotional feeling, is that it was a horrible day for him. Next stanza. To wicked deeds I was inclined, and wicked fancies crossed my mind. And every man I chanced to see, I thought he knew some ill of me. No peace, no comfort could I find no ease within doors or without. And crazily and wearily, I went to my work about. So he started thinking, you know, he started believing, maybe I'm going to cut corners. Maybe I'm going to steal this. Maybe I'm going to do this bad thing. If you've ever read or heard of the story Les Miserables, Jean Valjean 
uh, steals a loaf of bread in order to feed his family, right? And, you know, he's punished for it. Well, he's starting, this shepherd is starting to get some wicked fancies crossing his mind. He's starting to think, I'm going to do bad things. The world, the, so this event, so this is important in words in romantic literature, is that the, this event in the world affects his consciousness. And you're, there's no, um, you know, there's, there's an interrelationship between the two that's really important that plays out in the poetry, right? So he starts to get these wicked fancies because of this event that occurred. And the poet is trying to bring that out for you to, to make you see, hey, once the blood, once somebody poked him in the heart and he started dripping sheep, uh, metaphorically, obviously, these sorts of emotions and feelings and thoughts. If you remember from some of my other podcasts on Wordsworth, one of his goals overall is to trace the um, emotional reactions of the inner world of people. And this is a romantic idea. It's to see the inner world where there's one thing grander than the sea, that is the sky. There's one thing grander than the sky, that is the interior of the soul. This is when we, in, in human history, when we really get an investigation of the interior. Like, it's never been done like this. It's never been investigated or appreciated like this. And today we have this more, we, you know, even our literate, our stories, you know, um, you, you get this even in Game of Thrones where you get these characters like, you know, Tyrion Lannister like reveals some story about his back history, but it's, it's, a, it's, he's revealing emotions about it. And it, that's the whole, you know, that kind of idea was not as present in literature before this, not in the way that it was, where it was intent. We were interested in the inner values and the inner ways that we thought of things that became forefront of the romantic movement. And of course it starts here. Okay. Sir, t'was a precious flock to me, as dear as my own children be. Okay, so that's so the the shepherd is telling the stranger he met on the road, Sir, this flock was precious to me, like my children. Now this might be his mistake, by the way. So if we're trying to find a moral here, this might be part of the moral that Wordsworth might be saying. Although I think it's more complex than that, as I've tried to indicate. For daily with my growing store, I love my children more and more. So this is one thought. The flock was precious to me, as precious as my children, but there's a concomitant, a relational idea that for him, for this shepherd, that as his store of sheep grew, he loved his children more and more. Like they gave him the ability to love his children, but they're linked and this may be the problem in Wordsworth's eyes, is that they're linked like that. That you have to have one with, and you can't have the other. right? If you don't have the flock, you don't have the love of your, your family, that's a problem. Which it may be a problem. Alas, it was an evil time. God cursed me in my sore distress. I prayed, yet every day I thought I loved my children less. So again, now we're getting to the crux of the moral idea here. Is God cursed me in my sore distress. Now, we could argue, especially looking today, you know, with our knowledge, that he let his, you know, in self-help circles, we might say something like he let his, the wrong mentality into his brain. So once a negative event started to occur, he had to butcher things, you know, one, one sheep, then he wouldn't, he didn't think of other ways to get around this and find solutions except for asking for a handout. And so that caused him a, a cascade of problems. And in his mind, it came from on, in the shepherd's mind, it came from on high. God himself cursed him. This isn't my fault. There's nothing I can do about it. God is doing this. right? So that's what's happening in the mind of the shepherd. Now, is that true? Probably not. Probably God had nothing to do with it. I don't think even Wordsworth indicates that this is it's very important to remember this is the these are the words of the shepherd god did this to me damn god i prayed yet every day i thought i loved my children less he started to love his children less and every week and every day my flock had seemed to melt away they dwindled sir sad sight to see from 10 to 5 from 5 to 3 a lamb a weather and a ewe 
and then it lasts from three to two. And of my 50 yesterday, I had but only one. And here it lies upon my arm. Alas, and I have none. Or if this goes, I have none. Or you could think that it might say, like he's saying, alas, I have none. There's nothing left. Today I fetched, today I fetched it from the rock. It is the last of all my flock. So he could be saying that this dead you and this dead lamb in his hands is the last of his lock. Or he could say that this is all I have left. It's alive. Alas, this is all I have. I think there's um, two ways. I don't know if there's a certain way of reading that. Whether it is a de- whether it's dead and by the end of this conversation he's lost everything or whether he's just saying that this is the last one. And I think it, either way it works. Which one do you think? Which way do you think it is? Okay, so I want to wrap up by saying that this is a, I think this is a very powerful poem. You know, like, look at the words he's talking about. He's giving you lots of visuals of this man with the tears that were wet running down his cheeks. And um, and the kind of interplay between the shame that he felt, you know, and he has to, to bottle his shame. And there's this, this, feeling he's tr- that uh, the poet Wordsworth is trying to trace this emotional feeling that he's trying to trace in the man and this trying to say like, okay, so this led to this, which led to this. And that's why he feels this emotion. And one of the goals, remember we talked about at the beginning was to expand you, the reader, you in 2019, when I'm reading this and you know, if you're reading, if you're listening to this in 2040, awesome. Whenever you're reading this poem, His goal for you is to help you use your imagination to gain a grander understanding of morality, right? So he's trying to help you see or use morality better and try to see like, try to be able to use your own morality. So you need to be able to analyze this on your own and think about it on your own. So I did a lot of the work for you, but you know, if you go through it, you might see something a little bit different for yourself. And that's great. You know, listen and compare and talk about the two and, and share this with a friend. What is going on with the, um, the person, the, the shepherd? Why did he lose everything? Was it his fault? Was, did God actually curse him or did he make a mistake? What was his mistake? Right? How can we empathize with this person? We've all experienced this thing where people um, lose, or we, we might have heard of stories where people start losing their stores and you know their money start. They hit hard times, is how we talk about it. So they hit hard times, bad things happen, things cascade and go farther and farther into, um, you know, causing more and more problems. Another side of this is that the church didn't help this guy. Why didn't the church help him? Well, he didn't fit into the morality. Well, maybe that's a problem too. Maybe we're not understanding how to empathize with people and think this person is the type of person we should be helping. So ask these questions. Who is this character? Why is he acting this way? And of course, focus on the language, right? The, the, we're talking about his tears flowing. He's fetching from these rocks and he's giving, like try to visualize these things. Enter the world of Wordsworth. What is Wordsworth experiencing or or trying to get you to experience? Okay, well, I hope you enjoyed The Last of the Flock, and I'll see you next time.